I am very excited to um, introduce Samuel Jones, who has come all the way from the UK to be with us. He is, or has been until recently, an associate of Demos, an independent British think tank, which is focused on the place of culture in society. His primary interests center on the importance of culture in international dialogue and the importance of cultural heritage. In 2008, he co-authored a wonderful book called It's a Material World, Caring for the Public Realm, um, about the importance of preserving cultural heritage. He has an undergraduate degree in history from Cambridge and an MA from, in art history from the Courtauld. Sam recently became um, head of the director's office at the Tate, and he's working on strategy and policy, corporate governance, external relations, and administration. He also sits on the UK executive board of uh, ICOM, um, however, I think he would secretly be very pleased if you would think of him primarily in his role as tour manager and regalia secretary of the Demijohns Cricket Club of St. John's College, Oxford, for whom he is presently organizing an upcoming cricket tour to Gascony. For those of you who don't know, the Demijohn is a bulbous, narrow-necked bottle holding from 3 to 10 gallons of liquid. You can probably guess what kind. And while none of us can even pretend to understand cricket, you can also guess that they have a heck of a lot of fun. He also collects 18th century political satire, including Rowlandson and Gilray, with tempting titles such as A Voluptuary Under the Horrors of Digestion or The Pigs Possessed. We are thrilled he could be here with us today, and we thank the Cress Foundation for their generous support of his trip. Sam. Thanks. Um, I'm not actually doing a very good job of organising any cricket tours at the moment, I'm afraid, but um, I will get on to that. Can anyone hear me okay? Yeah. Um, first of all, good morning, and thank you very much for inviting me. It's great to be here. Um, before starting, I'll explain a little bit more about who I am and what I do. We just heard a bit, but um, I'm currently the head of the director's office at Tate in London. It's quite a complicated thing to explain, and I'll do that afterwards. But I'm speaking here today primarily in an independent capacity, based on the booklet that's just been mentioned, um, which I produced while I was at the think tank Demos in London. And Demos, um, to explain about the organization, thinks about issues that we think are important in the public realm, we think are important for policymakers and society to um, address, but perhaps uh, aren't gaining the right, to, right degree of attention. And in particular, I focused on culture and the relationship between culture and policy and how that relationship pans out in the context of wider social changes. I've also spent a year on secondment at the UK's Government Department of Culture, Media and Sport, or DCMS for short, where I was tasked with taking a fresh look at cultural policy and how it works and what it's actually for. So I've seen the challenges from both sides of the fence. I share and have written about the concerns of the cultural, cultural and heritage sectors. But I've also seen the, the whirring of the policy machine up close and all those clunking gears. And actually, in, in particular, how culture policy has to fit into the wider pressures of government. Now, the two don't sit necessarily together. The problem is, or one problem is, that in the UK and in many other places around the world, governments have, and understandably for reasons of the electoral cycle and accountability to operate according to values that can be measured and provide demonstrable evidence of success. Funding decisions for things like conservation tend to, um, tend to focus on immediate deliverables such as targets met, income earned, audience attracted, and so on. And success is often defined by, uh, by default to readily accepted norms and conventions. And one of the results of this is that the cultural sector has become very, very adept at measuring certain things and certain forms of impact. In the UK, for example, we know that tourism contributes about £60 million a year to the economy, or sorry, about £90 billion a year to the economy, and supports about 1.3 million jobs. We also know that 85% of tourists say they come to the UK for its culture and heritage, and that nine out of the top 10 visitor attractions are museums and buildings that depend upon conservation. Now, looked at in governmental terms, that's a considerable amount of impact. But 
thinking about it a bit more, such measures don't really get at some of the deeper values of cultural activity like conservation and why it actually matters, why we're all in this room. And that debate is very well documented, not least by my friend and colleague John Holden. But for our purposes today, suffice to say that the causes run deep and don't just apply to governments. And this wider context is a good place to start as we think about the deeper values of conservation. Jeff Mulgan, a leading political thinker, has written that leaders and governments tend to respond urgently to dramatic events, but ignore slow cumulative trends. The dominant forces in modern democratic societies encourage them to do this. Competitive electoral cycles, um, a, a competitive electoral politics attend to welfare prosperity now and not in the distant future. Meanwhile, competitive consumer markets attend to current issues and future need, and not, and not future needs. And competitive capital markets, meanwhile, generally demand immediate returns in which the future is quite literally heavily discounted. Now, Mulgan's world, words are actually echoed by a San Francisco group that some of you might have heard of them called the Long Now. And the Long Now comprises an eclectic range of thinkers from businessmen like um, Peter Schwartz to the musician Brian Eno. And they've set out to, um, to provide a counterpoint to today's faster, cheaper mindset and promote what they see as slower or better ways of thinking. Their description of what prompted them to act adds a social dimension to Mulgan's description of politics and, the, and commerce. Civilization, they write, is revving itself into a pathologically short attention span. So, alongside economics and politics, the trend might be coming from the acceleration of technology or the distractions of multitasking. And between the long now and Jeff Mulgan, it becomes clear that the problem of short-termism relates to government, commerce, and the public, you and I alike. The British political journalist, Jeremy Paxman, said recently that as time goes on, one gets increasingly conscious of historical background and diminishing horizon. Short-termism just won't do. And so many of those snake, oil, snake oils that we seem to be offered are merely short-term. This is a collective problem, and it requires collective solutions in which many different acts combine, and that requires a change in ethos. The thinkers of the long now focus particularly on the idea of responsibility. In other words, how people put long-term collective and social gain over the short-term, often individual profit that can often come at its cost. As they put it, that means mastering long lead times, long lag times, and the hidden effects of cumulative change. And they use this diagram to describe the different and necessary forces at work in civilization and how they relate. And they, it presents a different way in which we might think about society and our collective actions within it. At the top, a quick, quick moving things like fashion, commerce, and I put politics in there too. Society needs these to be responsive. It needs them to be adaptive, and it needs them to be innovative. At frenetic and quick paced, these layers have the glitz, and they gain the attention. Ultimately, however, they're anchored in deeper, more profound and slower moving things, like nature and culture. And the problem with short-termism is that the top layers have come to be valued in their own right and at the neglect of their connections with the lower. What's needed is something that will provide a framework for responsibility within which people can lead their lives in a more responsible way. And this is where a discipline like conservation is important. As well as preserving the artifacts of, artifacts of the past, it represents an ethic of care. In fact, the reason for my first involvement for work with the world of heritage and conservation is a practical example of the problems I've just outlined. It was mentioned a few moments ago, that a few years ago, I published the booklet um, that was uh, the It's a Material World. And it came about because of a, conserva a, con a conversation with the Textile Conservation Center, or TCC, which was then based in Winchester. Now, as I'm sure many of you will recall, the TCC had been part of the University of Southampton since 1999. But in 2007, when I first spoke to them, it was facing closure. The finance people at the university had looked at the books and decided that things just didn't add up. Look at it from their point of view. Like many higher education institutions, the university faced severe funding pressures. The TCC occupied prime real estate 
in one, of London, in one of England's oldest cities. Compared to other departments, the building had a huge footprint, and the staff-student ratio was low. The equipment and materials were expensive, and in addition, it was proving very difficult to find financial support for the centre. In the UK, academic funding follows a, follows a split of sciences and humanities, and despite the, the CCC's success in winning grants, it wasn't really clear into which conservation falls. And stepping back, the low profile of conservation and the public image of conservation didn't help. The stereotype of conservation is that it goes on behind closed doors, in a lab, and with things that people can't touch. It isn't top of mind, and so public outcry at the idea that there was a threat to the TCC just didn't come. In the UK cultural sector, because of the political pressures just described, public funding in museums tends to concentrate on immediate impact that can provide evidence of a, in the next spending review. So the focus on more audience numbers and ticket sales is prominent, and less on budgets for care and collections management. Furthermore, corporate sponsors are more attracted to causes like climate change that have more cachet because they seem more pressing and they've got a higher profile. So as the university faced funding pressures, something had to give. And a department that deals with long-term value and whose greatest benefits might not be clear for generations, let alone measurable in any readily achievable way, was closed. Now, at this point, I should say that there had been a happy resolution and the TCC has found a new home at the University of Glasgow. But the question of how to make clear the importance of conservation is in many ways more pressing than it was when I, when I undertook that work. Certainly in the UK, but I think elsewhere too, we are seeing a paradigm shift. Across the cultural sector, organisations are having to think differently. And as I'll explain in a moment, public and audience expectation is changing which presents a very, as many opportunities as it does challenges. In the UK and elsewhere, cultural organisations are also having to find new funding sources other than the state and, there are, and looking towards different funders like corporate, corporate sponsorship and even ph and philanthropy and micro-philanthropy too. And there are also more profound social changes at work too. How can conservation adapt to respond to all this change? Well, at part, the reasons for the TCC's closure were value judgments. It wasn't worth the investment. Other things were more attractive to fund. The public more, were more interested in other issues and so on. So the question isn't so much how to get more, more funding out of the same system, but what conservation represents and how that can be effectively communicated to different audiences. It's a material world argued that conservation should be recognized as integral not just to the cultural and heritage sector, but also to social well-being. It's part of caring for the public realm. But for that potential to be recognized, conservatives themselves must take the lead in communicating its values and relating it to the challenges around us. At first step, it seems a big leap from conservation, like that at the Mary Rose, to debates about the big issues like the economy, security, and social policy that preoccupy representative assemblies and governments around the world. But by stepping back, and looking at conservation in a wider social and political context, it become, uh, the links become clearer. Making a case for conservation requires reconsidering how it fits into society. And society is going through itself is going through a period of profound change. The global economy is struggling. New powers like India and China have brought different attitudes and beliefs to center stage. And 20-year-olds can change the way that we communicate. In particular, expectations, norms, and patterns are being disrupted. Where culture has in the past been sidelined, particularly in policy, it must now be taken much, much more seriously. I'll give you an example of why culture matters. You might all be aware of the TV program, the reality TV program, Big Brother, but you probably didn't expect it to pop up in a speech about conservation in Albuquerque. Well, in 2007, the UK celebrity version of Big Brother became infamous and even disrupted global um, economic discussions. Three of the cont contestants, a pop star, a glamour model, and Jade Goody, a woman from South London who had previously, who had first been catapulted to fame on, um, on the normal version of Big Brother, clashed with the Bollywood actress, Shilpa Shetty. Tensions had been mounting throughout the series. 
and eventually those developed into a full-blown argument. And during the argument, racist terms were used, and several of the contestants mimicked Shetty's accent. And as it unfolded, the story showed how social and technological change has catapulted cultural issues to the fore, and how we must think anew of the capabilities that people need to be cultural citizens. First, it shows how significant culture is in global society. The producers of the program had realized that by putting Shetty in the house, they could access vast audiences in India. But it's doubtful that they'd anticipated or prepared for the consequences. Second, the story reveals that new concept, that concepts of the, the professional, the expert, and the public and the citizen have been blurred. As I said, Jay Goody had herself first come to prominence in an earlier version of the show. And so here was a girl from Bermondsey, a pretty rundown area of southeast London, not only rubbing shoulders with a Bollywood superstar, but occupying a global stage. And her actions had international impact. The capacity of individuals, any individual, to act very publicly is a radical change. And pretty soon, as people fired off emails and copied links, the story spread around the world far more quickly than any conventional news cycle and far beyond the control of any organization. Third, cultural conflict caused a, crash, a clash. Ultimately, the reasons behind the arguments were probably personal, but the flashpoints were cultural. The row between Goody and Ch Shetty was sparked by how Shetty had cooked a chicken, itself a cultural form. And in the fight that followed, Goody played on the word papadum, another cultural form, in a way that caused racial offense. Put simply, the argument stemmed from the inability or lack of readiness of three young women to respond to or accommodate cultural difference. And finally, they also lacked the responsibility and awareness to anticipate how their cultural conflict would play out in the world at large. Relayed on television and broadcast around the world, the Ferrari impacted directly on politics. In the couple of hours that it took for the story to break and spread, Gordon Brown, who was then Chancellor of the Exchequer, was flying out to India for economic talks. And when he landed, he didn't face questions about the economy or trade, but what he got was a sea of protest about what the hell was going on in the Big Brother house. Talks on grand political, scale, um, political and economical issues was stalled by a lack of readiness on the part of a few individuals catapulted into the limelight to respond to cultural difference. Overall, events in the Big Brother house encapsulate the challenges, and, and challenges of managing a complex society. States can no longer predict or provide solutions so easily, and instead they have to think about and rely upon the capabilities that individuals and citizens will need and that they need to provide. And foremost among these are the capabilities by which people can live, coexist, and thrive in the modern world in a new and radically different public realm. The skills of cultural accommodation and understanding are vital, and people need a framework in which to develop them. And to understand why and how, it's necessary to break things down a bit and look at some of the challenges and changes of today. There are three that I think have particular relevance um, and relate in relation to conservation and provide a new way of thinking about its importance. They're all three connected and all can be seen at work in the Big Brother example I just gave. First, there is a growing importance, or the growing importance upon the idea of making. Second, there's the changing nature of how society and policymakers must see culture. And third, there's what I'm going to call the age of uncertainty. In isolation, these changes don't, don't provide a clear-cut answer as to why people should suddenly start funding an organization like the TCC. But they do provide a different context in which to think about how to communicate the importance of conservation. Let's take the first. The rise of making and meaning in an agency that people find in manufacturing production. The chain of events in Big Brother that ended up with Gordon Brown fuming in an Indian airport began with the way that Shilpa Shetty had cooked a chicken. Similarly, and like so much today, the controversy was both sparked and fueled by individual action on the part of housemates initially, but then on the, by other, countless others emailing the story around the world. Making has always been a vital part of society, but as a concept, it's regaining its power. 
The way that we make and do things says something about us. And today there's a growing focus on the material and the produced, which has given rise to a different way of looking at both the right to make and the communicative power of the way that things are made. Making was also the, the, recent sub or the subject of a recent and fascinating exhibition at London's Victoria and Albert Museum. The exhibition celebrated craft and the ingenuity of production. But it also discussed the relationship between making and modern society and revealed the importance of thinking about where things come from and how they were made. It emphasized the distance between the ethics of consumerism and craft. Consumerism is a prime example of a focus on a short term on short-term satisfaction over long-term values, and it has political ramifications. The dis disjunction between our sense, of, our sense of manufacture in the individual and the consumerism around us creates gnawing unease. The values of commerce have come into conflict with the values of happiness and humanity. And the exhibition went further than this, say, and it went further than saying simply that the artisanal is better or more pleasing. It also promoted an ethic of making an awareness, an awareness of the material as being a part of a good society. Making has to do with satisfaction and a sense of agency. It's present in our everyday and popular trends indicate its power. Celebrity chefs are so popular because people value craft and value handwork and individual, effic individual efficacy and, and they're coming to value these things more. In another example, knitting has, become, has provided the focal point for a global network of social gatherings. More and more, people are relating to the world through their industry and creative agency, something reflected in the rise of the creative industries. The exhibition at the V&A also examined the future of making, and this stretches way beyond the material and, con and connects to behavior. It will, be critical, it will be critical in politics, society, and the economics that are emerging Making is what underlies the conflict around copyright, the right to make running up against the right to profit from what you have made. And it's also manifest in hacking culture, which is disrupting the way that we have to think and also the way that companies have to behave. This is a Lego, Lego Mindstorm robot. Lego, probably more than anyone else, symbolized the idea of making. And Mindstorm was a new step. The cars and diggers that I remember from when I was a child had grown up to become fully programmable automata. Lego had made the breakthrough step of creating a toy robot that, ch that children could build, um, and they could program it as well. But when it was launched, the people at Lego were horrified. People had quickly hacked the code that they'd spent years perfecting, and all that work they'd done seemed to be being torn up and values stolen from them. But, when they, but when they, then they noticed that people were discussing the code online and working out ever more inventive um, things to do with the code. And they were, the robots weren't all they were building, they were doing other things too. And communities were forming, and, the group, and they were made up of people way beyond the conventional Lego consumer group. And Lego soon realized that rather than being a threat, this was something that they had enabled and was actually core to their business. Making had redefined their business model. And its spirit doesn't have to be geeky, and it can have momentous implications. It's manifest in the Twitter revolutions and riots that we're seeing around, that taking place around the world. The spirit of making is a spirit of activity, meaning, and empowerment. The individual as agent, telling the story of how and why things are made, made the way they were, and engaging people with the fabric of things is important. All this might seem a long way from the conservation bench and how to keep it funded, but actually it's part of a set of values. The conservation of objects that have been made keeps alive a reference point to the values behind their manufacture and use. And as I'll discuss in a moment, conservation is in itself a process of making meaning. And it's therefore, a central, or therefore central to an ethic that's becoming ever more important, the ethic of making and care. The spirit of making has radical implications. It means that politicians and society as a whole have to, have to look at the idea of culture very differently. We've seen how the incident in Big Brother centered on a cultural clash that took place in a cultural, me in a cultural medium and spanned rapidly out of control. Cultural activities like the theater or conservation have a significant part to play in how we address the challenges of the modern world. But 
Our assumptions about culture can often prevent this. Culture is a notoriously difficult word. The Cambridge academic Raymond Williams once described it as the most difficult word in the English language to define. It can mean the arts. It can mean the way that we lead our lives. And especially with modern technologies, culture can also refer to popular entertainment forms, which are often commercial and determined by markets. And we tend to separate out, separate out these forms of culture. And talking about this, I've been accused of confusing them or confusing different ideas. But in the publication I wrote as part of my own secondment at DCMS, I argued that that separation means that we don't really see the wood for the trees. Governments and funders often focus on the first meaning. In other words, set ideas of, art, of the arts. And they both receive the lion's share of attention and are lionized at the same time. By and large, they're safe and can be categorized as being inspirational, educational, or entertaining. The thing is that, again, because of technology, but also changes in behaviors, attitudes to consumption and the self, and indeed the making that I just described, the different kinds of culture are coming together in new and more powerful ways. People can now produce and create as easily as they can consume cultural forms. And conventional ways of thinking about culture and the arts are no longer quite so meaningful. For instance, the Guggenheim launched YouTube Play, the first professionally curated search for content generated online, not just by artists, but by members of the public too. Tate's own new website offers to people the chance to comment on work and curate their own collection. And in the process, the boundaries between the culture, culture as the arts, popular culture, and culture as the way we lead our lives are becoming blurred. These shifts in approach to culture are critically important because culture, in the sense of how we lead our lives, is a formative part of society. It's part of how we recognize things like similarity and things like difference. It's how we form groups and communities around those things, and ultimately it's how we form society. It's why culture provides the bedrock of the long now diagram. The problem is that we tend to treat cultural forms with the ephemerality at the top layers of that diagram. But these are the thorns through which culture, as the way we lead our lives, is made manifest, either through, through creating or consuming them. People gather around their interests and identify otherness through cultural signs and symbols. And they can from, vary from the traditional, like a Uccello painting, to the multiple expressions to be found on YouTube and extend to things like food, clothes, and to activities like knitting, too. Together, these expressions represent a conversation between our values, and it's a whirling hubbub of noise and conflicting values that fascinates and disorientates us at the same time. It's part of what the sociologist Sigmund Bauman has called liquid modernity, a world in which behaviors, uh, behavior moves too quickly for institutions and structures to adapt, and so the frameworks around which we have built communities and societies fractures. In other words, People are using their greater power for individual choice to break free from outdated assumptions and structures, but at the same time, they miss the security that those assumptions and structures provide. I looked at this and worked on this with um, a, US, a US thinker called Bill Ivey in a publication called Expressive Lives. Cultural behavior must, must be, or needs to be seen as democratic expression, a statement, public or otherwise, of what we think is important, and a means of encountering the beliefs and ideas of others. It's critically important that a government is sensitive to this, and just as important that it should provide the means by which people can access and take part in it. This is a core part of what I mean when I say cultural capabilities. And among them is access to cultural institutions in which opinion can be encountered, expression given voice, and skills developed. Exclusion, or more correctly, feeling excluded, is not just missing out on the benefits of an opera or a museum as they're conventionally perceived, nor is it realized by thinking about the finances of ticket sales and profits. It's missing out on shaping society, and it's missing out on shaping the society in which you live. It's problematic if, it, if within this, different forms of culture appear to receive greater official recognition than others. And if some people have greater opportunity to shape and produce culture than others, because that creates inequality. 
And this is a different way of looking at ideas like cultural rights and cultural capital. And it should be a wake-up call to governments. It relates to how we manage society. Problems like the Big Brother house stemmed with a lack of cultural capabilities. It's also a different starting point for thinking about how and why money might be spent on displaying, showcasing, and conserving different forms of culture. Caring for things that symbolize value is important. It helps reconnect with those deeper layers of society, culture, and nature. The question of what we care for and how is important, especially amidst the, amidst the uncertainty of Bauman's liquid modernity. Amidst the cultural intensity I just described and the particular context of the global financial crisis, worldviews and frameworks have been shaken and deeper meaning is being sought. Around the world, the financial crash has caused people to question the values and the pace of preceding years. Before the crash, confidence and certainty had become part of the political and social mindset. New technologies convinced people they had greater command over the world. And famously, the journalist Tom Friedman proclaimed that the world was flat. New methods of commerce, like Amazon and iTunes, allowed people to take greater control of their options and choices, and at the same time, encounter a far greater intensity of cultural diversity than ever before. And the result is that we're exposed to different worldviews that both challenge our own and also make it harder to adapt to change. Recently, I spoke in Finland to an audience of think tanks and civil servants. One of the most common concerns in the room related to the impact of migration on society, on, on the country, and in particular, as it happens, new Somali communities. Finland has historically been a very homogenous society, but on the streets of Helsinki today, different attitudes, beliefs, and customs are much more visible and palpable through forms, different cultural forms like clothes, music, foods, and so on that symbolize a different source culture. And this has disrupted the older, compartmentalized view of culture that I, de I described earlier, and has created political uncertainty. And one effect has been the rise of the parties of the right, like the true Finns, who secured 20% in, in Finland's general election last year. And there's a connected concern on the left over a declining faith or belief in the welfare state, previously very strong in the country. And at the heart of this is cultural difference and the challenging of things that were considered certainties. In Finland, as elsewhere, the welfare state is built on ideas of similarity and the enlightenment concept of sympathy. People were, were willing to contribute to the good of the wider whole because they identified with it. But, challenging, but changing social and global, global dynamics mean that such basic lines of connection are no longer so clear and that the tacit foundation of welfare economies is weakened. And at the same time, the short-termism I described earlier has meant that people concentrate too much on those top glitzy layers of society. On the one hand, immediate gain was to be made. On the other, there was no need to um, take stock and things seemed to be, seemed to be available plenty. And the answer is so sure. As the financial crash takes its toll, the price of such attitudes is being exacted. When money flowed, few questions were asked, and this has grave implications now, because as things seem less certain, we don't have the answers to the basic questions of what really matters, what can't we afford to lose, and what does it mean to lead a happy life? Well, in response, governments are turning their attention to the idea of well-being, and Nobel laureates like Amartya Sen and Joseph Stiglitz are working on ways of assessing governmental activity that focuses less on gross value added and more on indications of happiness. We've realized that aspects of life that take time and provide less immediate, immediately measurable impact, but are very important, have been ne neglected and undervalued. But the snag is that the structures of society, states and markets, cannot adapt quickly enough to new priorities and find it difficult to think in terms other than economic measures. And the same applies to people too. And the sad parable for this is climate change. Immediate gain has been made from extracting oil, cutting timber, and burning fuel, but the long-term cost will be astronomical. I think the question facing us is, is the same true for our social and cultural resources? Society needs spaces in which people can encounter, examine, and question values. We need constantly to remind ourselves of longer-term visions and develop a more collective ethos of thinking long-term and a framework within which to support that. 
So what does all this mean for conservation? Well, conservatives, as you well know, don't just fix things when they're broken. They stand for a wider social ethos of care, in which individually and collectively um, people can take responsibility and action. Heritage and con conservation are a part of an ethic of responsibility and a means of connecting with deeper values. They also play a vital role in building a greater awareness of cultures around us. They represent the valuing of things past and present for the benefit of now and in the future. And in fact, they're manifestations of it too. This is the famous White Tower at the Tower of London, under wraps for conservation. The historic royal palaces, the organization that manages the site, could have used a conventional sign like, we apologize for any inconvenience caused. But instead, a virtue was made of conservation and a virtue was made of the work that was going on. The act is as important as the preservation of the form. So what things, values, and ideas do we really need to protect and care for? How does the act of conserving things and the process of deciding what to, what to conserve and how to, how to conserve it affect society? Drawing people into the process of how this is determined Using conservative expertise and experience to do so makes conservation itself an expressive act. Some things will always need experts and some kinds of conservation are very good examples. When treatment is carried out in public, people stand in wonder and the skills and knowledge on display. And this, where possible, and as many people in this room will know, is a very powerful means of communicating the values and work of the conservator. Organizations like the British Museum shown here and the Brera in Milan have recognized the power of conservation in public to attract and engage audiences. But there are other forms of conservation in which people can be more involved. Some of you might know this guy. He's the Cern Abbas giant. He's one of the most familiar sites in the English, in the English countryside. And in fact, he's so well known that during the war, he had to be dulled out because he was providing a landmark for incoming air raid. Put simply, he's about 180 foot's worth of fertility symbol carved into the hillside in a little village above Dorset. Each year, the National Trust, who were responsible for him, conserved him by allowing the local sheep farmer to graze his flocks on the, um, on the giant, trimming his outline as they ate. But the credit crunch hit us all, and in 2007, the sheep farmer went bankrupt. So there weren't any more sheep available, and the National Trust had quite a task. Trimming the outline, the grass outline of a 180-foot giant requires a good deal of time, a good deal of effort, and a good deal of energy. And as the story of the Textile Conservation Center sh shows, that's expensive. Deploying 20 PhD conservators with fly mows on a hill isn't a good use of resource. The solution that the trust found was to ask volunteers to come from around the UK. And people came, and they came from far and wide. One who'd made the 500-mile mile round trip from Leeds explained why. In his words, it's really hard work, but it's not often you get to work on an icon. It's in this way that conservation has much to contribute to the challenging context I described at the beginning. Caring for the material world is important. It's meaningful, and as the volunteer I've just quoted demonstrates, it provides the opportunity by which people can connect with objects, buildings, sites, and artifacts that convey something of their identity and who they are. In choosing what, what things to conserve and how to conserve them, we reflect and create social value. Conservation animates connections with those deeper underlying values in society. And in its, in its material world, we connected the idea of conservation with that of social capital. Social capital, in the words of its most prominent theorist, the sociologist Robert Putnam, is the glue that holds us together. It's the common concerns and interests around which we form groups and communities. And unbeknownst to Lego, it's what the hackers found and created around Mindstorm robots. And it's what the people involved in Stitch and Bitch, the knitting groups, found. It's also the resource from which those groups draw when they face challenges or problems. The volunteers who worked at Cern Abbas and those who give freely of their time to work at other heritage and cultural sites all over the world aren't just working on objects, they're preserving a past that they value for the future. They're connecting to a sense of community and making a statement about what they value for others. These are the temples of Genet in Mali. And each year, worshippers conserve them 
as a ritual and religious act. Looked at this way, conservation is a form of social communication that cements and reinforces social capital. But if it's a communication, it requires a language. And this is why the conservation profession matters. It provides a logic and touchstone. It can help people deal with the uncertainties I mentioned earlier. Society itself is structured around a multitude of different professions and sectors, and these embodies, embody ideas, practices, and beliefs. For instance, doctors and medical profession provide reference points for healthcare, the police and the judiciary for law and order, and so on. And the same is true of the conservation sector. In its material world, we make the point that a spectrum exists between, on the one hand, complex professional work, and on the other, the more everyday decisions that you or I make. Ultimately, the decision, say, to preserve the Mary Rose, is based on the same values that you or I uphold when we choose not to leave a photograph of something that we like in the sunshine. They're about caring for material objects that convey something significant. And at the more social level, this encompasses decisions like not dropping litter on the street. As a society, we will only stop littering if we begin to value the appearance of the material world around us. The point is that such change is rooted in the same values on which the conservation profession is built. These are the values that conservators can help to promote. And extended to society as a whole, it involves asking what symbolizes the values that we want to sustain and how do we want to go about doing so. More than that, however, conservation could be a space in which the continual negotiation between the values that comprise culture can be clear. And this is a critical part of social sustainability in the modern world. This is Hinamihi, one of only two Maori meeting houses. Hinamihi should technically be referred to as a she, because she is a manifestation of a Maori god. And she's currently to be found in the grounds of Clandon Park, a National Trust property in Surrey in southeast England. And she was moved there in the 19th century by the then owner, the British governor of New Zealand. And since then, she's functioned variously as a boathouse, a grotto, a storage, and various other things. And in some ways, she's the sadly familiar story, or she represents the sadly familiar story of colonialism. But the National Trust is working with the Maori community in the UK to con conserve her in such a way as to preserve her living values. So working with the Maori community, Hinamihi is once again being used as a Maori meeting house. Through Hinamihi, members of the Maori community not only have a means of connecting with their ancestry and their heritage, but also communicating those values to others. And doing so raises very interesting questions because one of the ways of caring for Hinamihi is to give her the very best. And if that means central heating in the cold British winter, to keep her warm, then so be it. And this flies in the face of very traditional um, preserve things in aspect attitudes that some National Trust members have. But by working with the National Maori community in this way, the conservatives of the National Trust are using conservation to create, create live value and at the same time challenge expectations of the discipline itself. Situated in the UK, Hinamihi is a touch point with a different kind of culture. She's an idea that's being preserved, and she provides a point at which different values can be brought together. In this, conservation's use to society is not just in the value of the things that are conserved, but in the meaning of the act. Involving people and different communities and different cultures in that is incredibly important. And so too is finding ways, of different ways of conserving culture and creating it anew. When it comes down to it, it's really very hard to convince a hard-pushed and hard-pressed finance officer that the Textile Conservation Centre is worth its cost. But by thinking about how conservation relates to the public realm, how the values of conservation can be communicated more widely and its practice opened up, it's less likely that that question could be asked so bluntly. Thank you. So I was really struck in your talk by the, um, the graph, uh, I guess, that comes from the long now concept where you had nature and culture and, and building to the outside ring, which is moving the fastest, which is art. Two things I thought was really interesting about that. One is that um, often, you know, we talk about art and culture as this, almost in the same words, you know. So it's interesting to see that culture maybe is moving more slowly than the art, which is on the outside of that ring. So I thought that was really interesting. 
And along those lines, um, later on in your talk, you equated um, global warming or global climate change um, with some of the cultural changes that are going on at the same time. So I'd just um, like to hear um, you comment on uh, how if culture is supposed to be more stable and more slow moving like nature and sort of further down on that ring, if, uh, if we're at a point now where our culture is changing so rapidly because of new media and um, technology, uh, how is that, how are those two things coming together? First, we have culture that's supposed to be more slowly moving and more evolving, but um, if, we, if culture is more like global climate change, which is sort of drastic uh, changes that are going on, you know, how is that going to affect culture uh, in the future if, if, it's more, if it's changing more rapidly? Thanks. Was it Mike? Yeah. Um, it's a really good question. The, I think one of the most telling things for me was that as the TCC was being shut, the same institution, um, the University of Southampton, was opening an oceanographic centre. And it presented no less a logistical task, funding-wise, than, the, um, uh, than the, the TCC. But the problem was that people were prepared to throw money at it. Now, that, that tells you something. Why weren't they prepared to pay money at the, um, throw money at the TCC? Well, it's actually about the communication and the comparative of the, the concern about climate change and the lack of awareness of the kind of changes that I've described. I think you're absolutely right about the tension between the arts culture and the f fast, pacing, fast pace and slow moving culture in that diagram. And I wouldn't say there's a ready solution. I wouldn't say that it's something that is as, um, can be, it's not something that can be resolved, but I think the point is that it creates really quite deep tensions, really quite big, powerful tensions. And the point is that how do we prepare people to deal with that? If people just disregard culture, cultural, if, if sort of society just, 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 just disregards those lower layers, then actually it creates the kind of uncertainty that, uncertainty that I described in Finland, and that's problematic. And we have to rely more and more on individuals and their capacity, capacity to negotiate in their own choices and their own lives between those different layers. So it's less a point about actually what are we going to end up with? How do we, you know, how do we have regulation around climate change applied to culture? It's actually how do we prepare ourselves for what is a completely different environment? Sorry, I've lost where you are. I can't. See, were there any more? Were there any more questions at all? You uh, you carried. Uh, you might talk about later. I think you're in a session on value later, but you mention on the one hand uh, conservators make value, which is actually very interesting. And I forgot who who uh, said that, but it uh, someone who's restoring a painting, for example, is creating value or remaking the painting. Uh, then you mentioned the public and that conservators are the experts and they should try and draw the public in. And on the other hand, you talk about uh, groups that are isolated. You, you were talking about in terms of culture. And it sounds like one of the problems is, it sounds like you're saying conservators should tell the public what is valuable. I'm sort of going, conservators tell the public what is valuable, but I'm just wondering how does it work the other way? I mean, there's sort of an elitism sitting in there. Why, why does the public not get to tell the conservators what they think is valuable. I think that's interesting. One of the things that I didn't speak about today, but we, we introduced in the pamphlet, was the idea of conservation juries. Actually, what do people think is important? Um, we used an example, again from Finland, actually, of something called talkut, which is a really interesting little ceremony, or it's a tradition in Finland, where each, each, on one day each year, members of a community come together and care for something collectively that is valuable to that community. And it could be um, repainting the post office. It could be re retiling a roof, or it could be some form of conservation. If there, is there something, is there a statue that they think is important? Is there, are they, should they be working together to draw conservators into that process? So again, this isn't a sort of zero-sum game. It's actually how do we take on those exact questions when, how do, we do, how do we apply the expertise of the conservator um, in one instance, but actually allow space for people to contribute to that process? Where should the expertise of the, the conservator be deployed, and when should the expertise of the conservator be sort of you or be exercised? So again, it's a, it's, 
it's looking differently at the, the kind of decision-making process and how to involve people within that, but also making it clear why expertise is being deployed when it is. Does that answer your question at all? Okay, one more apparently. Where do you see um, conservators as stepping in and expressing the non-commoditized, in a sense, part of value? Because we're in, in, we're in a society where so much does come down to economics, um, and the short-term decisions do tend to be based not just on economics, but what is fashionable in my institution, what is fashionable today is digitization and not necessarily the preservation of the original once it's digitized, uh, or an understanding that the digital format needs some preservation attention. Uh, what I struggle with is, in a sense, the vocabulary to break through. I can speak on technical terms and uh, sort of conservators vocabulary, but it's, it's that communication, that sort of, I guess, Twitter speak, um, what used to be called sound bites, but are now, is now put in terms of 140 characters to um, how do we learn? Where, where do you see conservators learning more effectively that type, this type of value communication that goes beyond the economics? I think there are two separate questions in there. And correct me if I've misunderstood. The first is actually different, relates to different value systems at play. And the second relates to communications within new media. Um, last year I was a an event with um, Neil McGregor from the British Museum. And I heard him use a very interesting example, which is the, the Cirrus Cylinder. Now, the British Museum wanted to loan the Cirrus Cylinder to Tehran Museum. Um, and as an organization, two organizations, it was, it was perfectly acceptable. Um, it was fine and, and they were fine with the arrangement. But the problem was that when insurance companies got involved, and they wanted, it, they wanted a financial value to be put on the, British, on the Cirrus Cylinder. And the simple answer to that is, well, we can't. How can we possibly put a financial value on the Cirrus Cylinder? Um, and we'll, well, we have to in order to loan it. And then you enter a whole new problem, which is that, well, wait a minute. Um, we could either put a, something that would even slightly approximate what its value is, in which case, the museums wouldn't be able to afford it, the actual system, or afford to insure it. Or we put a price on it that we think the museums would be able to afford, in which case it's offensively low. The only way we can actually do this is to do it on trust. Now, what's more important? We have a financial value on the Cirrus Cylinder, or that goes to Tehran, and the whole load of values, non-monetary values that come out of that. It's a perfect example of how monetary value systems don't they, mi they miss a lot of the values that we're, we, we need to take on. And that's the precise reason why governments are having to take on things like well-being. It's why they're getting Nobel economists like Amartya Sen and, and um, Joseph Stiglitz to think about how we measure happiness, how we measure well-being, as opposed to gross value added. The second question about Twitter speak. Um, well, I think it's not so much sort of a direct... Um, learning of a different language, I think it's relating to different worlds. And I was saying to someone yesterday that when I was writing this pamphlet, and a lot of my, a lot of my friends, a lot of my colleagues were saying, well, why are you, well, what are you doing getting involved with 18th century samplers from Winchester for? I said, well, look, it's not just 18th century samplers. They're hugely important, but there's, another, there's a computer game restorer in London who had worked out the code for Pac-Man was threatened, I, I don't know the details of it. But actually, when I was able to turn around to say to people and say, look, this is a form of conservation too. We might not have Pac-Man anymore. It was something much closer to their hearts. that They began to realize that the same sector, the same values, deal with a multitude of things. 
And actually, the route in from that kind of Pac-Man to getting why it's important that um, the um, that we have someone, we have the skills to look after the samplers, and why that's important, and how it, and, to, and it, it's making those links clear. So it's that spectrum, if you see what I mean.